Today on the Clinton Donnelly Show, we're going to look at a proposed ruling from the IRS to tax collectibles, particularly NFTs, at a higher 28% long-term capital gains rate. This is really a higher tax rate. This is shocking for a lot of NFT people. You need to listen in on this call where Andrew Gordon from Gordon Law and I are going to tear into this IRS notice, throw around some opinions. It's going to be fun. I think you'll enjoy it. Well, welcome back to the Clinton Donnelly Show. I am excited to have Andrew Gordon with me today from Gordon Law. Andrew, please introduce yourself to the crowd and tell them a little bit about yourself. Well, Clinton, thank you very much for having me, especially on such a hot and relevant topic to many people in the crypto industry. Uh, again, everyone, my name is Andrew Gordon. I'm an attorney and also a CPA. I've been practicing in crypto tax since 2014, so several years, uh, everything including crypto tax reporting to crypto audit defense and even criminal investigations. All right. So as you can tell, Andrew's got a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge about the whole crypto space. So we're just going to dig right into it. Let me just give an overview for everyone. The IRS gave a notice, which is just a, an informational notice number 2023-27, which said that they are looking and want public opinion on possibly taxing NFTs as collectibles. Now, there's a special capital gains rate for collectibles, which instead of the regular capital gains rate long-term of 15 to 20%, the collectibles long-term capital gains rate is 28% long-term. The short-term gain rate is your ordinary tax bracket. So this would be an increase in tax for many people who are trading NFTs. This is a gotten everybody very upset and uh, it's a very relevant topic. I have certain clients who have thousands of NFTs and they have a lot of them. They hold more than one year. So this is a very relevant issue. When I told some of them, they just, you know, expletives deleted occurred, you know? So this is what we're going to dig into. Just as a little point of interest, I discovered that in 2004, presidential candidate John Kerry had released his tax return, and it turns out that he had made $175,000 on a partial interest in a 17th century painting, and he had reported it with regular capital gains. And those people that look at tax returns of presidential candidates found this, and they pointed out that it should have been taxed at the 28% collectibles rate. And he went back and amended his return, but it's a little bit of a public gaff off, you will. So this is a very real issue. Part of the reason the 28% tax rate is a recurring number in the tax code, it basically represents the flat tax in the US. It's basically the alternative minimum tax that's used to make sure that the very wealthy or people that can exploit a maximum number of deductions still pay a certain base rate, and that is 28%. So that's what this is all about. The idea that super wealthy people would have Van Goghs and that they would somehow sell them and get a lower capital gains rate on these things rather than paying higher rates. This is the general thrust of, of what Congress came up with this rule. Now the IRS is trying to apply this to NFTs. It's very, it's very disturbing. What are your thoughts overall about the whole thing, Andrew? Yeah, well, first of all, I'm glad that the IRS is looking at the issue and um, asking for comment rather than rushing into issuing guidance, especially if they were to issue guidance along the, the path that they were discussing in their notice. So first of all, I'm happy. I'm glad the IRS is doing that. I, I think this has been an issue that's existed without clarity really since the dawn of NFTs, where practitioners have been struggling with this issue, although most practitioners have reported NFTs as not collectibles, just using the general capital gains rate, I do think it is an important question that needs an answer because some NFTs do have some very close similarities to conventional collectibles, especially as NFTs like uh, sports cards and uh, NBA Top Shot 
came out and were very popular. So there's some analogies that are very close to everyday collectibles. So I think this is a very relevant issue. And especially, as I mentioned, if it's going to be something that the IRS issues guidance on, I'm glad that we have the opportunity today to present our thoughts to the IRS. And hopefully they heed those considerations from the practitioners that are out there. We can only hope. So let, let me uh, set the ground a little bit more for the, the listeners. We use the word collectible for a variety of things. You know, you get some uh, Jordan Air tennis shoes. Well, that's a collectible to somebody, you know, or you get a pet rock and that's a collectible. This year it's a collectible. Tomorrow it's not a collectible. But the collectible refers to actually it's the heading for a subject in the tax code, section 408. And in that paragraph M, so we will call it the 408M section, and it defines, uh, it, it reads this way. It says, for the purposes of this subsection, the term collectible, so we're defining collectible in a very technical way here, means, listen to these, any work of art, any rug or antique, any metal or gem, any stamp or coin, any alcoholic beverage, or any other tangible personal property specified by the secretary for purposes of this section. It also excludes the gold bullion, silver bullion, and platinum. So those coins are not considered collectible. So very specific categories are collectibles. And I should mention at this point in time that the secretary, meaning the secretary of the treasury, has never issued any statement about other types of personal property. So this is actually kind of novel for the first time. They might be looking at issuing something for NFTs. So the IRS in their notice gave uh, a whole slew of questions they wanted people to respond to. And Andrew and I talked about it and we're going to dig right into the, the meat of the issue. And the question has to do with, is a digital file a collectible? That is to say, if you had a you know, Board Ape Yacht Club NFT. That's really a digital file. It's a, a JPEG or something that's stored somewhere. And the NFT points to that specific JPEG. And uh, whoever owns that NFT owns the rights to that JPEG. But that JPEG is a digital file. It's what we would call intangible in the tax code. So the question is, would that qualify as a work of art? And secondly, would it qualify as a tangible personal property that the secretary could reference. What are your thoughts on that, Andrew? Yeah, well, I think you brought up a very good point, which is in mm -hmm. the code, which has a very specific definition of what a collectible is or could be, it references other tangible personal property. And so when read literally, that means that it needs to be tangible. And by saying other tangible personal property, it seems to refer back to the items that were previously identified. I think very reasonable interpretation of the collectible section could be that it needs to be tangible property. Now, here the IRS is trying to say that, well, NFTs, although digital, may still fall under this. But even if the NFT represents something like a work of art, that work of art is still intangible. It's not a physical work of art for the most part. There are, of course, edge cases where the NFT could represent something physical, but most cases that we see and talk about, it's representing something digital and intangible. So I think it's a very interesting question. And I think as we dive more into how this would be applied, we will see that where there isn't a bright line rule and where we have to be looking at every single NFT, and there are, I think, now thousands of different projects, it's going to become very hard in application to actually follow this and to be able to identify on a case-by-case -case basis whether or not the underlying asset is a collectible. You're right. I think that phrase, other tangible, pretty much draws a circle around and say, it has to be tangible to be a collectible. I think that's pretty big. I mean, if the IRS wants to push this argument, I think they're, I think they're going outside the, the purview of what Congress put into place. I think you're right. What do you take on the phrase personal property? That's an interesting phrase. That too is not defined. And personal property can be, when I looked at it, I mean, personal property would be as opposed to what? Of course, business property. And I also noticed in uh, section 165 of the tax code, which is on losses, it describes three types of property and talks about business property losses, 
personal property losses, but also investment property losses. Investments are transactions entered into for the purpose of profit, which of course would describe an NFT. It would be an investment loss. It seems to me that the phrase personal property also gives uh, the IRS some difficulty trying to pull NFTs into that. Right. No, I, I agree. And whether or not a intangible collectible would be considered investment property or personal property. I think you're right. That uh, draws another line that's very hard to differentiate. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's going to be very difficult. I guess one, one of the open phrases at the beginning is, you know, a, a collectible means any work of art. Now, wow. You know, work of art. What is a work of art? Now that's a term that's not defined specifically in the tax code. So we have to go look at common definitions and, and how the word is used elsewhere. When I looked at that, what separates a work of art from just a piece of art? <laughs> and it, what I read in one of the dictionaries was that there was something above and beyond a mere artist's work, that if the hand of the artist took you to some sort of like transcendent experience. So a child drawing a picture of Van Gogh's Starry, Starry Night doesn't quite hit the transcendent nature as Van Gogh's work himself when you look at it. When you look at it as a spectator, the piece of art takes you somewhere. It goes beyond the mere oil on canvas, so to speak, but something the tr sublime. And it could be not just art. It could be a lot of different things, but it has to be a certain transcendent nature, I think. What other qualities do you think would be necessary for something to enter into the work of art category? Yeah, and I haven't looked into the definition or the case law, but I think even an interesting term here is work of art, right? Whether or not this is something that was created for the intent of resale or it was just a, a children's drawing. And, and so I think even the, the intention behind it, but where we become very qualitative, how do we differentiate between a children's drawing and a Van Gogh? I think that's where things are going to become very difficult because what makes a bored ape, whether or not that's a work of art versus generative art in general or different types of NFTs. And so I think there are some that are very intricate that take man hours to, to create but is that the definition and whether or not one piece of art takes someone somewhere versus a different piece of art, I think that just creates so much subjectivity that it will be very difficult in practice actually follow through. Oh, I think that's a, the key word there is subjectivity. That yeah. really is a, a massive issue because, you know, you think about what makes something a, a collectible. I mean, the John Kerry story, they had a 17th century masterpiece. Well, okay. Right. It's old. That's a characteristic. It's called a masterpiece. So obviously it's a piece of art that others characterize as you know, being done by a master. And it's preserved, it's rare, it's unique. And of course, it probably is of high value because he sold it for a high amount. If it was a $10 masterpiece, well, it probably wasn't of a collectible nature. So the, the whole word collectible is itself very subjective. I know people right. who collect figurines you know, uh, Ladro figurines. They have hundreds of Ladro figurines. To them, it's a collectible. To me, I look at it, it's like, you know, these are dead statues and it doesn't do anything for me. You know, so collectible subjective. And if we look at the age test, I mean, what's the oldest NFT out there? Well, it's, you know, maybe a few years old at best. So how do we meet the age test? And what about the board eight yacht clubs? You know, these, these things fetched really high prices but now we found out that they're an infringement on copyrights and now they're worthless. So, you know, there's a certain test of time that has to come with a high price that uh, we just have to see where things go. I mean, there's oh, so many factors here. Yeah. And so just to quickly comment on that, while certain statues might be a collectible to someone and not to another, with respect to the tax code, it shouldn't be subjective. It should be explicit. We should be able to have a, a enumerated list as we do now and identify what is or is not a collectible. And I, I think that's where the issues will manifest itself with respect to NFTs. In the area of Bored Apes, for instance, originally people bought it because they liked the, the monkey pictures. Later on, it was because if you held that ape, you got access to certain things. You got access to concerts, to different merchandise, all different things. And so is access a collectible? Clearly not. And, and so it becomes even more murky. And then to your point, 
well, is that NFT actually representing ownership in the underlying asset? And with gutter cats versus board apes versus other assets, some of them you do have interest in the actual image and you can commercialize it. Others you do not. And so that in itself is a very detailed. And to what extent of your ownership in that asset actually means that you own that piece of art just because you have certain rights of resale, but you've got to pay a royalty. Do you still own it? And I think these are all questions that we'll have to get through. Oh, that's a very good point. Yes. Cause a lot of these NFT can be created with a royalty payment going back to the original artist every time it's sold. Right. Right. Exactly. Very interesting. I think maybe the IRS got confused. They see these pictures of board apes, mm -hmm. right? And I've seen people with their board ape, they got it on the wall, but these are just reproductions of the original. The original is a digital file and that's a reproduction. The reproduction can never have a collectible nature to it. It seems to me. Well, right. So generally there's an underlying image, a JPEG file that that NFT points to or represents. And so that image itself, yes, can be duplicated and that duplicate has all the same qualities as the original, but that's where I think even the ownership questions will become at issue because although you in theory have the rights to this image, do you have the rights to commercialize it? Can you sell it? You know, if I own a Van Gogh painting, I can do what I want with it. I can sell it when I choose. I can sell it where I choose. I can do what I want with it if I want to print a shirt with it. But with NFTs, those rights actually vary considerably. Yes. So you're saying that when we own a true classic, uh, like the Van Gogh, I have full ownership rights. And if I have limited ownership rights, when do I have enough rights that I would be treated as a collectible tax? Then we start to get into enumerating rights. And it seems to me that like everything else with cryptocurrencies, we're inventing new rights. We don't have comparable ones in the traditional world because it's such a, an innovative space. They gave an example of a NFT that pointed to a gem, like a diamond that, right. that represented ownership of that diamond. Then that would be treated as a collectible. Well, okay. You know, that's a pretty rare situation. And then they use the second example of some ownership of a piece of virtual land on some sort of decentralized exchange or blockchain where that was decentralized. It only had use of the land and therefore that would not be an NFT. Well, again, that virtual land is a, you know, it's a digital thing. It's an intangible getting back to our earlier conversation. I think those are two very extreme examples that the IRS put in there that don't really lead us to a good discussion of what the hard matters are that they have. It would have been great if they would have uh, provided examples of the most common usages of NFTs. For example, ownerships of uh, images of these JPEGs of board apes or, or different things similar to that. That's what most people are using NFTs for. But in that realm, there's this ambiguity. And so, right, I, I think when the NFT represents something like a gem, like actual physical land or property or even intangible property. I think that's very clear cut or should be, but really here where I think the IRS is going to run into the issues with the suggestion of the look through rule is when we start applying it to digital art, which is the most common use of NFTs. I think you're absolutely right. And I also realize that technology is changing. We now have virtual reality where you put on the glasses and you have a total experience. It would be almost as though it were tangible. Maybe it's the experience of traveling through and seeing Van Gogh paint the original Van Gogh or, you know, you know, starry nights or actually, you know, virtually seeing the texture on the canvas. I mean, there's, when we start to introduce all different senses beyond just sight, sound, texture, smell, taste, send, you know, physical sensations, all these things, you know, technology is starting to blur those distinctions and create new technology that I, I kind of feel this whole collectibles thing is 
really anchored in the past and it really should be left for going after the ultra wealthy, et cetera. Even the whole definition is just a struggling passage. We looked at it and we didn't find any case law on this. And that's an interesting point. Hmm. Why is there no case law? Is that because it's never been pressed to go to court or is it because the IRS settled without having to fight this issue in court? It could go both ways, right? And I think that's an interesting point you raised too about you know the original intent going against the ultra wealthy. And also though, when you layer that on top of the, the need for updated code based on, as you brought up, virtual reality, digital items, and we're seeing movement from the IRS to have updated forms, likely the upcoming 1099 DA and so forth. But in the area of crypto and NFTs, we had NFTs where the floor, the the minimum price to buy an NFT was hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so I guess going back to even the original of uh, this code section, which was to have this added tax on um, the types of uh, assets that the ultra uh, wealthy were trading, perhaps some of the NFTs really do fall into that. Now, I'm not suggesting this is the right framework, but at least there might be some basis for if the floor of an NFT is $300,000, should there be an additional tax on that? Well, this was a lot of fun, Andrew, talking. I think it's just, it you know, people shouldn't be scared of filing their taxes just because there's some gray and uncertainty. There's gray and uncertainty in life all the time. And you just need to make sure you find talented practitioners who can defend you. You know, don't panic. Just be confident. I mean, as much of this gray stuff is gray because the IRS doesn't know what they're doing and they don't want to fight a lot of it. So the auditor might take a swing at it, but it doesn't mean that they'll win if we push it in court and appeals. So anyhow, tell people how they can get a hold of you, Andrew. Check us out online. Our website is gordonlaw.com, Twitter, Gordon Law LTD. We're also on YouTube, really all social media channels. We've got a lot of free, useful information on crypto tax reporting, tips, advice, ways to stay out of the IRS's crosshairs and minimize your tax. So check it out. All right. Thank you very much, Andrew. And everyone, if you could please uh, click the like, subscribe and follow buttons so you know the drill. Your feedback is very important for helping to get this message out and share it with your friends. Thanks, everyone. Until next week.